with everything in my heart that if I do it God's way and obey His word, then there's nothing impossible with Him. So out of this kind of conviction, you notice every time I share from the word of the Lord throughout this convention, I will turn to passages of scriptures and I will share with you and bring out the intention of the author of the Bible on all these things. And the same here in planting churches. I've heard so many different ways people plant churches and they are very, very useful. But I found myself always constantly asking the same question. What does the Bible say concerning these things? So that if God's word says so, then I know it's God's way of doing such a thing. And that will help us to be able to know that everything we do will come to pass. You know, in, in the Bible, there's many, many different ways that it's written down there how churches are being planted. You can survey through the whole gamut of ideas in scriptures. And in fact, we found that churches are planted in so many different ways. For example, in Acts 8, I will have introduction. We found in verses 5 to 25, when the evangelist Philip went and hold a kind of evangelistic meeting in the city of Samaria. And then there's apostolic follow-up after that to confirm it and to get the church going strongly. We also see another way in Acts 10, in verses 24 to 48. In that passage, we found Peter, the apostle, with God-directed vision and visit to Caesarea. The church was planted there another way. We also found in Acts 11, which is in verses 19 to 30, the church in Antioch was started by so-called lay people, people, ordinary people who are not in strong leadership calibre in any way. They are not apostolic in that sense. They went there and witnessed naturally, spontaneously. And as they went to the city of Antioch, something happened there. There's a group gathered there, people got saved. And when news spread abroad and the apostles in Jerusalem heard about it, sent a representative there to help them as apostolic visit, helping laying foundation in that church. So we see all these various ways of planting churches. But one of the prime examples I'm going to bring about this morning is an example of somebody which is called a master builder, Paul himself, which I consider as I read through strategies of Paul in as he trying to plant churches and help those churches, he is indeed a master builder in church planting. So Paul 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 10 talk about him as somebody like an architect that know how to build with good blueprint, with proper ability to build strongly. And I believe that as we try to plant churches, we must plant it in such a way that it's going to be strong and stable and plant in such a way that will be able to multiply itself and continue to grow. These are the kind of churches that Paul seems to plant. The master builder Paul, church planter, we can learn from his example by looking at a passage of scriptures that I want to bring you through. It's the first time Paul went out in his pioneering church. It's his first round of went out to try to pioneer churches. Some people call it first missionary journey, but I rather call it the first round of pioneering churches. In fact, Paul went out always with the view of planting churches. In fact, I do not see that New Testament evangelism have any less intention than ending up in culminating in strong local churches. Any work that we try to be done in evangelism that do not have in view planting strong local churches is going to be deficient in some way. And therefore, in evangelism, we almost have, always have in mind that we must gather these people together so that they can be built up properly, so that churches can be established. This is the kind of thing that we've seen in the pages of the New Testament, particularly in the book of Acts. And so we found churches are being planted in Paul's effort, in his uh, pioneering work, 
in those days. This is found specifically in the two chapters of the book of Acts, Acts 13 and 14. I want to take you through a survey of these two chapters on some of the key ingredients that happened at that time that we can try to glean some principles together. How did he plant all those churches in those days? I discovered seven main ingredients on how to plant churches in Paul's way, in God's way, in Paul's style, in apostolic church planting. Seven main ingredients that I want to bring this uh, to your attention and submit this to you to consider. Let me paint the picture once again that church can be planted all kind of, uh, all kind of ways. And in fact, whatever way it's being planted, as long as it's planted well, it is God honoring and the Lord is pleased with it. But we want to come and ex examine a very good model. In learning a model from Paul, we may be able to apply that to every other settings that we are involved in. I know that methods can vary, but principles are the same universally everywhere. And in that way, we're going to learn principles together. How did Paul do that? And in our church planting effort, we often in our, in our own nation, we plant church in many different ways that we found in scriptures. And before we do anything in our church, we normally spend time searching through scriptures, try to find out ways of how that scriptures teach us what to do. And when we discover those keys, we try to discern God's voice in a particular circumstances and apply the right key to the right region and the right city and try to make sure that things we do are solidly biblical so that we know that God would bless us and help us to accomplish those things. So these are our ways of doing things. A majority of the churches that we plant are being done this way. In fact, the seven main ingredients that we do are the things that bring about a lot of church planting and birthing of churches all over. And we discover this to be universally applicable in both rural area and big cities. We plant churches in many, many big cities in our nation. Some cities are in millions of people. And some area we plant in smaller kind of setup, and yet it's all applicable. These are some of the keys that we often do. Seven main ingredients. Number one, we found this is in verses 1 and 2 in Acts 13. The Bible says, In the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now we found the first thing that is very evident here in the first two verses. A spirit-chosen team, I like to call. A spirit-chosen team. There is a team being formed here which is chosen specifically by the Holy Spirit in forming this team to go out to plant church. So this is the first ingredient which I like to break down into three main points. What does it mean to be a spirit chosen team that we discover in the first two verses here? The first thing within this first ingredient we found is written here clearly in verse 1. We found that the leaders were seeking for God's guidance in general. They don't have to seek specifically only whether they want to go and plant churches. But their leadership who are seeking God as a, as a lifestyle, their leadership who are always discerning what God is saying, what God wants at this moment in time, their leadership who are together, we notice in verse 1, all the leadership of the church was mentioning there. There were names of leaders mentioned there. And verse 2 say why they were worshipping and fasting. They were seeking the Lord. This is the kind of setup that God can speak powerfully. I discovered many, many times that God would drop names of a city in my heart. Sometimes when I was just worshipping privately, sometimes with the leadership in our small group in my home, every Monday, my leadership team of 15 people would be in my home and we would spend time together. 
and we spend extensive time worshiping and uh, praying prior to our sharing what God is spoken to our hearts and maybe sometimes sharing the word of the Lord together and many times names of city will be dropped in my heart and in their hearts and so often that names that is being dropped in my heart is the same name that dropped in their hearts and God confirms such a thing and cause us to know his direction you know many times when we, we know God's will and God's purpose in a certain city it makes things so easy when we get there to try to do his will by planting churches when we know it's the mind of the Lord in this we discern his will we know God is really in it when we discover that kind of city we found that things is unfold and one another incident is not only when we directly try to see God sometimes you can sit in an aeroplane and God has dropped that burden in your spirit of certain city I remember one time I was in, in an aeroplane flying to another city and God just spoke to me a particular city that we need to go and take hold of and as I heard that word when I landed that the, the aeroplane landed I discovered news and things that are going on that there is our people who are moving to that kind of area and all those are other many other factors come to play that confirm that God really want us to go to that city another time I was in uh, having a crusade in one particular church in the north of our country and as I was preaching evangelistically you, you, you can imagine that while you're preaching God would disturb you by telling you a city that you're going to go and, and plant a, a new church next, next time after this it shouldn't be the kind of time that God speaks to you you were concentrating trying to preach evangelistically while I was standing there I hear this word clearly called Chiang Mai Chiang Mai is a very large city we can consider it's the capital city of the northern part of Thailand so I quickly make a long distance telephone call to somebody after my meeting who I knew in that city and say could you gather two or three of these people who have been uh, con corresponding with me and saying they're very interested for me to visit them whenever I can come through so I say I'm gonna have it just happened to be that my plane have to, to change in transit in that city of Chiang Mai after on my way back it's God's arrangement and my transit there it happened to be three hours so these people came and we have a good chat at the airport of that city and it was God's timing and the Lord already moved in the hearts of these people and I was challenging this medical doctor which is a he is a medical doctor specialist for, for child care and he's a medical doctor and I, ch I challenge him that God put in my heart that even though he's a so-called a lay person had never preached before have no understanding of scriptures in a sense of able to be to be a pastor of any kind I said God put in my heart to train him to be the pastor of that church God already dropped that in my heart so I challenged him the guy took it by big surprise he said I don't know how I'm gonna do this but you know sure enough God worked in his heart and he said yes and he traveled every week on the bus eight or nine hours on the bus overnight to come down to Bangkok to be with me spend the whole day and travel another eight and nine hours on the bus back so he spent two nights out of seven nights on, on the bus for years traveling down to be trained and to be with me unusual circumstances like that and as a consequence I went up and planned a new church I hold some evangelistic meeting there I went there for solidly four months to lay the foundation for that church today that church meet in the cinema they must have at least about seven to eight hundred people right now after maybe less than three years so that church grew powerfully to become a major church and now planting other churches and the person who lead the church in fact have never learned how to preach he know absolutely nothing of how to run church but by being with us we train and we help him that's called spirit led kind of church planting where you really know that God wants you to do something in a particular city and you just ask the Lord and when the Lord gives you that word then you just go ahead and do what God says so things like this keep happening when you hear God's voice 
exactly what city are we going first. So the Spirit would direct and guide us. The first thing in this ingredient is leadership seeking for God's guidance. In meetings, we often accomplish more when we hear God's voice than trying to do it on our own. When we discern the will of the Lord and know exactly what God really wants. I remember one time, we do things so unconventional. We were, we were seeking the Lord for a meeting place for our church. And we were trying hard to, to discern God's mind on this. And the Lord told me while I was sitting in my little car, uh, just, on, just a few seconds before I leave my car, I hear this word, go to a hotel. So I went and looked for a hotel, and the Lord gave me the favor in the eyes of the hotel management and gave us a place where we can meet and even including giving us all the lunches and everything for, for our Sunday meeting. It's almost like giveaway. And they never done that to anyone in that kind of uh, cost. And we, as a result, the church able to continue to grow because we hear God's voice. When we fill up that hotel, I was praying with our leaders on a retreat away somewhere. And the Lord dropped something in my heart, say cinema. So I went, and when I returned to Bangkok, there's only one cinema which is empty. It's the biggest cinema in the town. And it was just closed down a few months prior to that. And it's the only cinema that is closed down. And as we negotiate with the owner, we got the cinema, and that's where we are presently meet right now. So hearing God's voice as we seek God's guidance and discernment of what God really directs is very essential as we want to do God's work effectively. Leadership must always be in a posture of seeking the mind of the Lord together as a team, seeking His will and His purpose. Now, leadership seeking the Lord is one thing. Then, when you seek the Lord and you, the Lord give you the understanding of the kind of people you should form as a team, we found in verse 2 that the Spirit directs Paul and Barnabas to be together as a team. So that's the second thing under this first ingredient of spirit chosen team. Leadership, seek, seek God's guidance, number one. Number two, form a team. When you know that the Lord has already directed you of some sort, then you form a team together. Paul and Barnabas was such a team. It is sufficient, no matter how many people, as long as God is the one that formed the team, then you know that this is sufficient for the task. Paul and Barnabas came together by God's grace, calling them to work together. And this is often what we look for in the very beginning. We always find key individuals that can form together as a team to conquer a particular city. There must be an individual that is a leadership of the team and the team members that we form together so that when they go forth to try to plant church, church can have the kind of people that can be left behind to able to help that churches. So we found that there is a team being formed there to do this. Recently, we are, we are forming a team that just itinerating, going out, pioneering new churches, staying just for a few months in some city, and ask after a while, leave behind a particular individual to take the lead of that work and move on to plant new churches. These are some of the other new in things that we are doing apart from what we have already been doing before. Teams that is keep moving from place to place and just keep planting new churches. Form a team. When the team is formed together, sometimes we form it as an embryonic kind of a team in the womb of the mother church. Whereas there they function as a team, getting to know one another, able to relate together, disciples, those in the teams, so that their heart is merged together as one, so that when they go out, they can work in unity and in cohesiveness. This is the kind of uh, team relationship that can be built. The team can vary from certain numbers, uh, maybe from 2 to even 15, 20 at times, or 30. It depends so much on various localities that we go to. And that team is being formed together. Once you form the team, there's strength in the team. 
so that they can complement one another, they can help one another when needed. So this is the kind of setting we also do. Then the third thing that I want to bring attention to that is clear here in uh, this setting in Acts chapter 13 verses 1 and 2, Paul and Barnabas both are apostolic men. Now this is very uh, essential to understand in our day and age when we don't quite understand apostolic ministry to the full sense. I believe that church planting that's going to be most healthy must have some relationship to apostolic men. Without that relationship, we'll find that churches would lay foundation that we have to unlearn later. There will be problems that come forth that no one can help care for. We, I have surveyed scriptures and this is what I found. In the book of Acts, all churches that being being planted there that we found in the book of Acts are either planted directly by apostolic men or quickly helped by apostolic men. In fact, there's only two churches that are not being planted by apostolic people. That is Acts 8 and Acts 11. The two cities that we found there, but quickly we noticed something that Acts 8, when Philip caused a group of people to be converted there, the Bible tells us that John, Peter and John came there quickly and confirmed them in the, in the work of the Holy Spirit to help them. In Acts 11, in Antioch, we found that Barnabas as an apostle went there to help. So we found in conclusion that the whole book of Acts are full of story of church planting directly by apostolic ministry. And those churches that are very few which is not planted by apostolic men are churches that are quickly hooked up with apostolic ministry. And this is what my conviction believe in these coming decades if we don't we have that much more time. In these last days that we have, God's going to raise up apostolic ministry of much uh, different caliber than we have ever experienced so that we can see churches being properly grounded, to be healthy churches. These are the kind of model that I see that will come to pass. We're going to see movement of churches that is being uh, helped by many apostolic ministries so that these churches will be able to build some kind of strength into their church, proper foundation that can be laid in there. We found here, as I said again, Paul and Barnabas are being sent there and being used by the Lord to plant churches. So the three, three, I, I, three points here, aspects of the first ingredient of spirit chosen team. I believe those teams must be related somehow to apostolic men. That's a, the third in point in this first ingredient. Spirit chosen team. That's number one that we discover. Number two, we found in Acts 13 verse 3, the next verse. The Bible tells us now further, after they have been chosen by the Holy Spirit in a team, Verse 3, the Bible says, So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Now we found that now they fast and pray one more time. Before that, they were just seeking the Lord in general as a habit, as their lifestyle of discerning God's will and purpose as leadership. Now after God direct them, why are they fasting and praying once again? I think they are doing spiritual warfare here in verse 3. They are covering this whole enterprise in prayer and committed to the Lord that the Lord will go ahead of them and direct them in what to do. Now we found here some, some aspects of spiritual warfare going on. I don't say that we always have to, uh, to do spiritual warfare in a specific way, uh, in a kind of safe example, naming the prince of the city and by them. I don't see that evidence in scripture anyway. So I don't think we need to always say that we have to find out the name of the prince over the city and we're going to bind them before we ever do anything. I don't see that kind of attitude in New Testament church planting. And, but I don't, I don't think it's anything uh, wrong and unexpected either if God does reveal. But we don't just go and pursue them as a formula 
as if if we, do, if we don't hear the clear discernment of what the name of the prince of the city, we couldn't do anything. In fact, we can do all kinds of things, even though we don't know the name of the prince of the city. So I'm not talking about that kind of spiritual warfare. I'm talking about committing this to the Lord. I'm talking about fighting spiritual warfare in prayer, in concerted effort together to cover that city with the work of the Lord, where God will prepare the way. God will cause the hearts of the people to be ready. Principalities and power need to be bound. May the Lord help us to be able to find a way into that city, find keys into that city. But there must be a certain amount of prayer direct toward that city so that we can really break through and open that city up. I believe that the Lord has prepared a way for my city five years before I returned home. I didn't share this with the larger body last night and I hope to weave it into my messages somehow if, if I, didn't, I didn't forget. But the Lord gave me a very specific direction in 1976 in Australia. I was praying one day and this direction comes so strongly to plant churches in every district in Thailand. In fact, I never even knew how many districts were there in Thailand. I went to the library the next day and quickly tried to find out how many districts were there. So I just quickly count the number of districts in the information that come from the library and discover roughly about 685 districts. So that was an assignment that God gave me, which, which caused me with great fear and trembling, not knowing what to do and how to do. But that was the assignment that God gave. And the only thing that I could do is to pray. I, I remember vividly that the Lord really moved my heart. Every time I pray for the city of Bangkok and the nation of Thailand, after that day when God visited me that morning in 1976, I would find myself weeping in tears every single time without miss for five full years. I don't understand what's going on in my heart. I don't understand why this is happening. I didn't even try to make myself cry. Every time I would just start praying, I would just find myself weeping. And sometimes I'm so embarrassed in public at times. When I'm praying and I would be weeping every time praying for that nation, the Lord was really putting some burden in my heart to feel that burden, the compassion for the people in my own nation so that I can go back and do this work that He called me to do. I believe that at five years prior to my return back to Thailand in 1981 is the time of real spiritual warfare of praying for the people of the nation. And I believe that accounted for some of the breakdown in the heavenlies. In fact, when we returned home immediately, I, I, I was teaching in a university, in a, in a graduate school of economics. While, while I was there, I was planting the church together at the same time. Quickly after I returned home, by very naive, and thank God for being naive. I don't know too much of what's going on. I just believe God sent me back for an assignment. If I know too much and be so too sophisticated, maybe I would have too, too much unbelief and maybe I couldn't do much if my, those unbelief still there. But because God sent me back I with that confidence that the Lord really wants to take that nation for Himself, I just plant church in a style which is most unusual than any, any other people that ever done in that country. And the result happened, people got converted every Sunday from the very first Sunday we start until last Sunday. Every Sunday will be people converted and join the church. This is something that's happening because I believe there was five years of praying. I'm not saying that you have to pray a long time before you do that. That the principle still stands. That there must be spiritual effort in spiritual work. Church planting is not just human methods of doing. Sometimes you read a book on church planting in uh, modern day literature, in missiology, you often wonder whether there is a spiritual dimension going on in there. You, can't all, you almost think it's a more demographic kind of a study. 
is more contextual, institutional reason, is more uh, all the right kind of setup that you set up so that people can come. You got to put your church in the, near the highway so that it's visible. Then you have to use all various different gimmicks here and there to try to get your church going. I even heard a, a particular story some, uh, somewhere in America that is being, uh, which, is, uh, which is very amusing. And I think it's, it's great if you can do it that way. Somebody was just uh, exchanging, I think, a, a $50 bill for some dimes. And this guy wants to plant a church in a particular city. So all he does, he just went through the telephone booth of that city and got all his dimes ready. And he telephoned up all those numbers and said, Hello, my name is so-and-so. I intend to plant a church and meet in a particular hotel on a particular Sunday. If you're interested, please come and join. Thank you. Bye. And he go for the second one and keep going. By the time he finished all his dimes, the Sunday come along, he had 50 people there in his church. Now, that can only happen in America. <laughs> it doesn't happen anywhere else. Particularly in pioneering situations where there's no Christians there. You, it doesn't work in areas when you have no Christian. In that sense, I would say is that we have to have some spiritual dimension in it a little bit. Allow God to do some work there. When you read those literature, as I say, you almost have a feeling that if you have right kind of uh, physical setup and everything uh, being done properly, then you'll get a church going. But I feel that as we labor in trying to plant His church, it's a spiritual work. There must be elements of praying, bask ourselves in praying it somewhere so that God will break through. I'm most excited last night when I discovered, when the, when the Lord dropped the name of that city, uh, Coventry, in my heart. I have never heard of that name even one time in my life. I never heard of it one time. And I'm, I discovered that's where you're going for your Bible week uh, next year, just uh, after the meeting. And I'm excited because it's purely spiritual work. Knowing the Lord is the one is doing it, saying it, confirming it. And you can go with all your strength and your mind. You know that you're in God's will. You're in God's purpose. I like that kind of setting more than just planning it all and thinking it all out only. And nothing wrong with planning. As you get to know us more, you know we plan a great deal too. Planning is not unspiritual. But there always must be an element where you really allow God to move. Allow God to be involved in it somehow. And praying and seeking God and doing spiritual warfare for that city is very, very essential. As we do that, then God's preparing the hearts of the people. As I said, it's the first time that there is a church in Thailand that has people converted every Sunday. Every Sunday, no matter what you preach, they'll be converted. That is really encouraging for a visiting preacher. <laughs> you can preach anything and then they'll be converted. And this exactly happened again and again because God is in it and doing His, His work in the hearts of, of people because you pray and you seek the Lord in this thing. Spiritual warfare is the second ingredient that we do. The third ingredient, apart from spirit chosen team, we know the team, we know we do some spiritual warfare. Then we found in verse 4 here another ingredient that not necessarily go in this order. I just name it according to the passage of scripture. Verse 4 says, The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Now, this is just an example in verse 4. Cities are being named there. And Paul targets those cities. Those major cities are the main target that we like to touch. I believe that in God's strategy, he worked from usually major cities and then from major cities to touch smaller cities. But that doesn't mean that there's no exception to the rule. There's some incident even in scriptures you see that Paul didn't go for the largest city at, uh, at times. But cities seem to be the main concern of Paul. When you look at his strategy, 
He looked for major cities. He targeted major cities. And he tried to reach those cities. That's why if you can touch the major cities, the next step is inevitable that you'll fill the whole area up. Our, our strategies in, in our natural planning, in, in the way that we found in scriptures, is to naturally go, go about by trying to plant church in major cities first. Unless God moves otherwise, we will go, out, go ahead and try to plant in major cities. We found Paul do the same thing. He wanted to, he assumed that God gave him the whole, the whole world. And he's going to Asia. But the Spirit tell him not to. And therefore he redirects his effort to Macedonia. But without the Spirit direction in that way, he just assumed he'll go to major cities. So in the natural, we can keep going to major cities. But in those major cities that we can choose, we can find out what, which one that God has a specific purpose in specific timing. But naturally, he go for major cities and target those cities. I target the major provincial town in our country. We hope to get it done by 1993, all the major cities. And then from there, we'll multiply to all the districts. And in fact, we're aiming that by before the, the, the century close, when we touch all the major districts in Thailand, then we'll move to all the sub-districts and all the villages. I'm planning to plant churches in every single village in Thailand. There's about 60,000 villages. So by the year 2015, if the Lord's tarry, we want to multiply churches so that it becomes a nation that is filled with churches, lively churches, not just nominal churches, churches that are strong and alive and well. This is where I'm heading. This is what I'm aiming in my heart. The year 2015, if we have that much time left. And if God speed it up, I don't mind either. <laughs> but at least we aim by 2015. So once we go to all the major districts, 685 districts, then we go to the sub-districts and all the villages. In that way, we'll cover the nation. From the big city, then it can help smaller cities. If you go to a smaller city, it's usually much more difficult to go to a bigger city because naturally city is in, in God's plan and God's purpose and you know that by the year 2000 a lot of cities in the world will be in millions of people there will be something like 500 cities in the world that have more than certain million numbers of people so cities are very essential if you target those cities then you almost can take the lot in that area you just go naturally, all those, you branch out naturally to all those areas. So when we talk about planting churches here, we're not pl talking about planting a few churches and add it to our team. We're talking about planting churches that can multiply itself and fill up the whole area, the whole nation, the whole region, and the whole world. As we plant the right kind of churches, we can do so. Target those cities, that's the third ingredient. Now the fourth ingredient, once you have a team, you know the city, you do spiritual warfare, the fourth thing you do is just go in there and evangelize. Verse 4, the Bible tells us, right there, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed there to Cyprus, and from there onward, the Bible says, when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. And continue on in verse 6 and right through to verse 7 and in fact verse 12. Telling us the evangelistic effort that is going on there in that city. You can only win people by evangelizing them. You can't win them by just trying to set up your church there and put a newspaper advertisement there. You want to come join us, come. That only works in Western world when you have nominal Christianity around. That only works when there is church population that is floating and not knowing where to go to church. You probably can get a few come across that way. But in area where you're pioneering churches, where there's no existing Christians, the only way is to evangelize them and form team of evangelistic team where they can go out in, that, in the whole area there and start preaching and proclaiming the word of the Lord. 
I just came back from planting two churches in the past two weeks. This is the first time in, uh, I missed my Sunday service two weeks in a row. I planted two churches, one in Melbourne, Australia, and one we plant a church in northeastern part of Thailand. And the last one that I went to, and we have a crusade, evangelistic healing crusade. We have people coming to our services, and our people go out and um, talk to people, and witness to people, and share the gospel with people. Amazingly, as you share the gospel, there's a power of God moving in the hearts of people we hear. There will always be people in that city that God already prepared for you. That is something amazing to me. Every single church we plant, we always find a, a body of people somewhere who are ready made. God already prepared their hearts to receive our message. People who just, when they hear the message of the gospel, who will respond readily and say yes to it. They'll come and join. I, we've seen some of those people who, most unusual, we see, we see people who most resistant to the gospel before and open up because God prepared their hearts. Every city that God gave you, if you go evangelize, you'll find a pocket of people that God already called them, prepared them to join your church. It will always be there as long as you do your task, faithfully evangelize and preach the gospel to them. And I, I discovered out of that uh, evangelistic meeting, on Sunday came along, it was most amazing. We jammed our, we jammed our auditorium in that, in that particular church. For the first Sunday we were there, there was at least 150 people who were, who were there with their families who seen miracles, who came and witnessed the power of God and came along and soundly converted. These kind of things happen. Let's take a look at Paul's evangelistic strategy. Paul is a very simple man. His evangelistic strategy is very simple. He didn't study comparative religion very much to try to convert these people, though there's nothing wrong with it. And we must understand the background. I think Paul has a good background, understanding philosophies. He, he, when he argued with the, the people in Athens, he you knows Stoic philosophy, all these things. But you, you notice that in his most usual way of evangelizing, he wasn't intellectually trying to beat them down intellectually, but he's just demonstrating the power of God. And we see this New Testament evangelistic model. In fact, the only evangelist in the New Testament that is being mentioned specifically is Philip. And his evangelistic model is very simple. Preach the gospel, confirm it with signs and wonders. One miracle will tell the lot. I seen the eyes of some of these uh, people in, the, in those cities we went to. I, I wish I had a camera with me. When they, when, they, when they saw the miracle in front of their eyes, I can literally feel that their eyes come out from, from their socket. <laughs> they were just so, so taken up. You'll never th see anything like it. When you start seeing people walking, when they know their relatives who haven't walked for 10 years and walk, they can't help but say, I believe. And they'll bring all their clan in with them too. The whole family members and everybody come in because they are so thrilled to see God's effort. Now Paul has two aspects of evangelistic strategy I want to summarize for you. The first aspect is to evangelize the most responsive people first which is very evident. We've seen in the verses 4 to 7 in Acts 13. We found here the Bible says, and Paul went there and proclaiming the word of God in Jewish synagogues. John was with them as the helpers. And they traveled through the whole island until they came to Papos. They met Jewish sorcerers and false prophet named Bar Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. Now the first thing we found here is evangelize the most responsive people. God always have a group of people that's most responsive in each city. We got to discern in the spirit, discern even in our natural understanding. Which group of people is most responsive right now in this city and go for it. 
that kind of people. Paul has a standard strategy. He divides the synagogue. That's Paul's standard technique. He went into the most responsive Jewish people with a background of some kind of Old Testament understanding. He went in there, see how the good one leave behind the bad one and take the good one along and plant a new church. The basic strategy of Paul. You like Paul, you would better like his church splitting. <laughs> That's the way he does. He called those people who are ready to be used of God and called them in and into the, into the major purpose of God. The Holy Spirit already prepared those kind of people. And in every setting of evangelistic work, there is responsive people all over. We found in Macedonia that responsive people that's why the Lord know that. Therefore, he told Paul, don't go into Asia. Go to Macedonia through a vision. We talk about the woman of Samaria, woman by the well, responsive. Jesus shared the gospel there. The Nathanael to Philip, responsive people. Look for those kind of people that is responsive to the gospel. There are certain kind of people most resistant to the gospel in Thailand right now. Give you an example. The military people and the policemen. This is unusual. There must be some kind of bondage over this group of people. We find them very difficult to be converted. There are certain kind of certain pockets of people we notice that are clearly responsive to the gospel as we preach. In every city, there are certain kind of people. You have to discern in your own setting who are responsive people. Look for them. We found the responsive people. Then the second strategy, which is clearly happening in verses 8 to 12. Verses 4 to 7 is evangelize the most responsive. Verses 8 to 12, we found he evangelized with signs and wonders. Basic two-step evangelistic effort. Look for a responsive pocket of people. Show forth the proclamation of the word with signs and wonders. Verses 8 to 12, the Bible says, but Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So we see here demonstration of power encounter, demonstration of signs and wonders that a proconsul believe as a consequence of Paul performing miracles and commanding this man to be blind who is against the Lord and his work. So we found here signs and wonders happen that accounted for the conversion and the situation right, right there. If Jesus need to do miracles, to proclaim the gospel. If Paul has to do miracles to proclaim the gospel, who are we? Who are we? We say, well, we are blue blood gentle English gentlemen. <laughs> we don't do miracles around here. We don't need miracles. If Paul has to do it, Jesus has to do it, we have to do it. We have to depend on God to do it. I remember another story. Another province, I planned a church in a very major city. In fact, the city with the second largest population in Thailand. Something like, I think, six to eight months ago. I'm not very good in time frame. So when I say six to eight months, it could mean six years to eight years. <laughs> I don't know how many. <laughs> I don't know exactly the time frame. But I went there, and there's a particular uh, family there. The daughter was converted in our main church in Bangkok. Soundly converted. And then the family back in that particular city have not been converted yet. But her grandfather has a broken back and he hasn't been walking for something like 10 to 12 years something like that and pardon me for this expression 
he can't even do anything himself that the family member have to carry him into the toilet and stay there in the toilet room to try to help him in every way. So this, this elderly man of about a little bit more than 50, <laughs> I will make good friends here. <laughs> Now this, this man, this granddad, has broken back, can't walk, never heard the gospel one time in his life, and the whole family members. Now, remember this. The father of this girl is a, is a son of this granddad, and the whole family living together in the Asian style. They're all in together there. Never heard the gospel one time. But the Lord do a marvelous miracle. As we went there in that city, all we did, because we, at first we cannot, we cannot do anything uh, with uh, all kinds of people we need to pray for, all we did is simply pray on a handkerchief, like Paul did. Pray on the handkerchief, they let the power of God came down, as a handkerchief being put on that family member, may he walk. Now this granddaughter, just by faith, take the handkerchief and and we just lay hand on this handkerchief and command it in Jesus' name to heal that back and cause the, 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 the granddad to be able to walk. As she returned home and put this handkerchief on the man, immediately, in that very second, the man get up and walk and run. You just imagine what happened to the whole family <laughs> when this thing happened. The whole family just can't help but come along to Sunday and join the church. They don't understand what it's all about, but we join the church. I want to belong to the church. Now, this thing happened again and again. In fact, we don't record down our miracles. If we do record a lot of miracles now, we could write fat volumes of books going on. We have so many miracles happen that a dear friend who is a professor at a Fuller Seminary called Chuck Kraft, came along one time just to want to find out the miracles that happen. It happens again and again, sometimes in an extraordinary way, quietly, that is no fanfare. We, have, we found another man, an example of another man. This guy is a real Buddhist who never heard the gospel one time. He came into our Christmas miracle rally. In, <laughs> That's a very good time to have rally. <laughs> he came in and he sit on the front row. And I was preaching the gospel. And I went, I went straight to him at the conclusion of the meeting because I really uh, challenged him and said, would you like to believe? He said, no. <laughs> and why are you here? He said, I want to be healed. I said, you believe? He said, no. <laughs> he doesn't believe even. But I just had such a faith that day, so unusual. That faith that rise within me so strongly that I knew with absolute certainty that as I lay hand on that man, he'll be healed. The man had twisted mouth because he's paralyzed half, half the body. He can't walk and uh, he, his saliva was dripping all the time. Just sitting there in the front row. As I lay hand on the man, the man just walk, shoot straight up, start walking around the auditorium. And that evening, he returned home by bus. When he came in, he's being carried in. And he told me later on that the next morning, his mouth was untwisted. He go back to work as normal people. And he disappeared for two years. After being healed, he didn't come to church. And later on, two years later, he one fine day, he walked in and I was greeting the people at the door. He said, you remember me? I said, no, I don't remember you. I want to be honest because I see so many people every Sunday, I don't remember. He said, I'm the one that was being healed. I said, so many people being healed here. I don't know which one here being healed. He said, I'm the one that you, you, you pray for me and I walk around. I vaguely recollect and he said, yeah. And two years ago, I said, where have you been? I said, well, I just thank the Lord and I, I, I stopped worshipping idols. I become a Christian. But I didn't know I was supposed to come to church. Because as a Buddhist, we, we, have, we can be good Buddhists without going to temple. So 
So I assumed that I can be a good Christian without going to church. <laughs> so he didn't, have, he didn't turn up in church for two years. Then we say, good Christian, go to church. <laughs> so you come to church every Sunday. So I'm still seeing him around every Sunday now in church. Miracles happen. Things like this happen so that people are drawn to the Lord. I remember vividly the first year and a half, we have so many miracles happen. This one particular lady, so amusing, came to our service. He, she sit on the front row too. He said, I don't know what kind of a meeting is this, but I'm hearing that anybody sick you can come to this kind of meeting and they'll be well. I, I, she doesn't know what kind of meeting is this, but she just wants to be healed. There were words going out from mouth to mouth that if you want to be healed, you come to that church. That kind of a setting will produce people who come and be converted. And miracles conserve the fruit of evangelism and cause the follow-up to be much more easier to be done. Because it vividly, dramatically portrays it for their eyes that God is real. We must believe in miracles. We must be convinced and we must expect God to move in signs and wonders. This is what we found. The two simple aspects of evangelistic strategy of Paul as he goes to pioneer churches and as you demonstrate some key miracles in that city, the whole thing will just roll by itself. They will bring other people in to the church and people would expect more and more miracles to happen. Paul's strategies of evangelism is this twofold. Evangelize the most responsive, evangelize with signs and wonders. We saw, we, we saw this thing as a cycle going on. In every city without miss, Paul go to. He would do this. Let me just give you some illustration of a few cities. Cyprus, Pisidian, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. Let me just go through this, these things together. Cyprus. Let's take a look here. That we have read just now. Cy the city of Cyprus. Verses 4 to 7 in chapter 13. Paul went to the Jewish synagogue, the more responsive, in verse 5. Verse 7, the pro proconsul, the person which is more really responsive person, Paul preached. Verses 8 to 12, signs and wonders happened in that city. Elemas, the blind, in verse 11, we found that Paul demonstrated power. He was blind. And verse 12, the proconsul believed. So we see these two elements of responsiveness and signs and wonders. Now when you go to the next city in Pisidian, Antioch, in verse 14, the Bible tells us further in that city, after Perga, they went on to Pisidian, Antioch. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. Now, he had this habit of going to the most responsive. In Paul's day, the most responsive people are the Jewish synagogue. They have the people who have the deposit of God's truth. Among them, there are responsive people that respond. Once they don't respond, then Paul go on to the Gentiles and look for more responsive people. So he go along to find people who have some kind of consent to that belief and try to bring those most responsive in. In verses 42 to 45 in chapter 13, example of responsive people, we found here, as Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. Responsive heart. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts of Juda Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, Almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. So we found here responsive people. In verse 46, when certain one is not responding, what did Paul do? He go to responsive again. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We have to speak the word of God to you first. Since you rejected it, do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. We now turn to the Gentiles. So Paul always looking for responsive people all the time. The result, verse 48. 
When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. So we see responsiveness is the key word that Paul looked for. Then Iconium in chapter 14 verse 1. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively to a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. So we found again when he go to the city Iconium, he went to the most responsive people preached there. Look at the, the second principle in verse 3 in chapter 14. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do the miraculous signs and wonders. Signs and wonders confirming the message of the preaching. The next city, Lystra and Derby. In chapter 14, verses 7 to 9, we found here Paul went to responsive people again. And that responsive people to be people with needs. The lame man. We found in verse 7. Where they continued to preach the good news, in Lystra there sat a man crippled in his feet, who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed. Now Paul Search for people with needs. They are responsive people. In verse 9, the Bible tells us the second principles. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw they had faith to be healed, and called him, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted, and so on. So we see the demonstration of signs and wonders in these cities, in the whole cycles of doing things. So that is the fourth principle we discover. Evangelism by responsiveness and signs and wonders. Now the fifth ingredient that we found here is continue on in verses 21 to 22 of chapter 14. The Bible says they, pre they preach the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they say. Now we found here the fifth principle, gathering the converts together for teaching. After evangelism and demonstration of signs and wonders, now gather them all up in one bundle, in a group. Gather them for teaching. Gather the converts together. The goal are threefold. We found here in verses 21 22. Number one, strengthening. Number two, encouraging. Number three, warning. There are three things that Paul did here in gathering them with the motive and purpose of goal of teaching, strengthening, encouraging, warning. We also found in Acts 15, verse 41, similar thing. In verse 41, he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So the gathering of converts is to strengthening them, to encouraging them, to warn them. These aspects of working by grouping them together is most helpful. I often use sometimes a house somewhere where people can gather together or a premise somewhere we can use together so people can come together. You discover that without gathering them, they'll be scattered everywhere. You'll find them sometime down the years. They say, I was healed in that meeting you were there. But they never attend church. You have to gather them. Make an allocation where you can bring them all in together. Sixth aspect of this. Verse 23 in Acts 14. The Bible says further, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Now we found the sixth aspect of this thing, train and appoint leaders. Training and appointing leaders are the sixth aspect of making sure that the group, group that you gather together will be able to continue on and survive. You must train leaders and appoint leaders over them. Training are various ways. We found here leaders, not leader. Leaders, train plurality of leadership, elders here. 
which eventually become elders. We make a point in our church, we don't make eldership quickly. We make sure that they are functioning first before we make them formally one. So we train leaders and make sure that these leaders can function and looking after the flock. And the final aspect, I know my time is up, so I'm speeding up here. Chapter 15, verse 36. We found, the Bible says, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord. And we see how they are doing. We found here the seven aspects. After training and appointing leaders, they didn't, Paul didn't leave them behind, but he continued to watch over them. There's a relationship between churches that he found. There's apostolic relationship. He went back and visited, we found here. Similarly, in Acts 18, verse 23, we found the same thing there. In verse 23, after spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. He went back, strengthening them, visiting all those churches. Our leadership visit all our churches monthly. Every month, we all visiting our, our churches. Our leadership went out in various regions and visiting, preaching in those churches. So all the churches are being helped and not being left by orphans. There's relationship there that we help them. The relationship with new churches is clear. We found Paul's relationship with the churches that were unique. We see that there is no such a thing called churches as ultra-independent. Ultra that is on their own so much that they don't need some kind of help from apostolic covering. We found here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 to 2, they're uniquely related to Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 to 21, Paul corrected them and warned them as his sons. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1, he gave orders. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 33, the rest, he said, will be in order when, when he came. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 4 to 12, he commanded them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8, and chapter 13, verse 10, he used authority for edification, not for destruction. So we found Paul relating to those churches, visiting them, and he wrote all those, those letters to correct their problems. We found that watching over those churches will help those churches to be able to grow the way God wants them to grow, and they can multiply in other settings. So we found these seven important keys that is found in Acts 13 and 14. Paul first round of pioneering churches to be very important keys to help us to find the principles that we can work it out in details in the pragmatic sense, in practical way of how to do things. But the seven keys are the major thing we do in planting all those churches. And I pray that these keys will be helpful for us as we're thinking of embracing the vision that each local church planting other churches here as well. Let's pray together. Father, we just want to thank you for this time we can share together biblically how to plant churches God's way. Lord, we believe that your manual is still the best manual that we can follow. And as we do it your way, Father, we are so thrilled to know that the result will surely come to pass. We pray, Lord, that all this principle that we adhere to may bring fruit in our lives as we bring it to pass in our ministry. In Jesus' name, amen.